What is your guilty pleasure genre of music? I don't know if I have a guilty pleasure genre of music, to be honest. I listen pretty much to um, jazz stuff or jazz adjacent stuff. Um, and I also don't think it's, you, I also don't think that you should feel bad about listening to all different genres of music. Music is music. I'm with, uh, I'm with Ellington on this one. You know, he's got that famous quote, you know, there's good music and then there's the other kind. And, uh, you know, so as long as it's good music, I'm down to listen to it. I guess I could say like my, I could, maybe it's a guilty pleasure, I guess. You could put it in this category, but I love listening to like really great brass music, like brass ensemble music, whether it's trombone choir or like a really great brass section in an orchestra. Like that was my first like love in music, my first really deep um like obsession in music was when i was like i used to my neighbors used to hate me because i would open the windows and like blast these trombone choir recordings or like orchestral things like the planets like the holst thing or like um yeah just different brass type things or like you know, there was a, a period where I was into like listening to drum corps shows and like just loud, strong brass stuff. So all different that I guess that's the guilty pleasure. I haven't checked out any of that stuff in a long time. I think it would all come flooding back if I started listening to it again. But I'm mostly listening now either to music that people send me to release on the label. Um, Outside in Music is the name of my uh, uh, record label media company. And so we're listening to new releases and we also do a new podcast every month that talks about new releases. So I'm listening to new releases from other labels and other artists. Uh, once they come out, just check those out, see what people are doing, stay on top of the trends and see what labels are doing what and try to, you know, carve out our unique place in it. So, you know, I um, try to keep on top of what people are listening to. So basically, yeah, those are my, I guess, my guilty pleasure uh, listening things, but I haven't listened to them in a long time. That's, a, that's actually a good point. I haven't listened to it a long time. I like, uh, but I'm not like a big, I don't have like a big pop or rock thing that I like to go to. Um, I really like thoughtful music, whether it's classical or whether, regardless of genre, when it's really put together well is what I like. Um, the next thing I'm going to listen to the next time I'm having time to listen to something, as I just discovered that Christian Scott put out a new, a new album, a live album like a live album of his of a show, a couple shows, a week's worth of shows or whatever in New York at the Blue Note. So I'm going to kind of dig into that. I'm really interested in how he puts albums together and how he um, blends electronics and acoustics and the tradition with modern stuff. And um, I think I think he does it in a really great way, a really interesting way. So I'm going to get back to checking out some of what he's been doing. That's uh, Christian Scott, if you're just joining the call. And um yeah, so that's what I'm kind of listening to right now. Uh, not necessarily that's guilty pleasure. Like I said before, if you didn't hear what I said, um, I don't think you should feel guilty about anything that you're listening to. It's all music. And uh, again, I'll give you that du the, the Duke Ellington quote. It's very cliche, but, you know, there's good music and the other kind. So I think it's cool. I think you should listen to everything as much as you can um, because that's going to inform your overall music musical choices when you're playing, you know, as a player, if you're freelancing in some scene and you need to play all different types of gigs, you got to know all different types of music because you can't be playing your uh, Coltrane substitutions over, you know, a funk gig or a hip hop band or, you know, it just doesn't fit. It's not the right vocabulary. You got to have the context, you know, the context is just, just as important. And I like to say like the how is just as important as the what if that makes sense. It's the how is just as important as the what, meaning like how you're playing, when, how much, the stylization, all of that kind of stuff. It all comes into play when we're talking about uh, music and being a freelancer and all that kind of stuff. How much have you experimented with effects pedals? I've, exp I've done that since... Uh, done that definitely at the beginning of college, if not in um, high school. I bought um, like a... Zoom, no, not Zoom, Boss, a Boss multi-effects unit. Um, and I've experimented with a, a bunch of electro harmonics pedals. Um, I've checked out, I checked out a bunch of records that Robin Eubanks did with electronics. His setup is like way more um, advanced, I guess. And he uses a lot more outboard gear. I just kind of use like guitar pedals, but there was a band I played in in college where I, 
that was like my, my gig was to play like the quote unquote electronic trombone um, stuff. So I used to do it more. I have it all still. I've put made some videos and put them on YouTube of just like solo improvisations with electronics. Um, so I've experimented a around it with a bit, experimented around with it a bit. There's a new microphone that I keep getting targeted with on um, ads on Instagram uh, for this. It says, it says that it tracks live human voice or instruments to MIDI to send to, not to MIDI, but to, to um, you can you can use it for the effects, digital effects, and, and actually I think it does also track to MIDI, and you can combine it in different ways. I have to look up what it, what it was called, but uh, I want to check that out. I don't know if it really works well or not, but so I don't know if that. I mean, the answer is yeah. I've been doing it for a long time. Will um, I? It's it's hard to do it. You know. I mean, there's actually there's a record that's just about to come out where I'm playing. It was it's more of like a free kind of noise uh, album from a group called Quintip Quintipus is the name of the band that we recorded last summer, and it's coming out in the fall. And we and it's just like kind of free and free music, and I use a lot of electronics on that. Uh, yeah, so I'll find that mic and send it to you. Well, I forget what it's called. When I find it, I'll try to put it into the description of the YouTube video that this ends up being, but I can't remember what it is at this exact minute. Um, and if you do try it out, I want to hear if it works. But I guess the main the main trouble that I find with the electronics is that I never have time to really experiment enough to feel like I can really um, use a lot of it. And I, sometimes I don't want to overuse it. You know, you get a delay going and you create some like textures, but like you know, there's cool things and I feel like I've tried a lot of them, but I haven't found something that I want to stick with. And then I know like some of the Randy Brecker stuff, like the type of effects he's, he has used. And I've tried to use some different like harm, 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 bleh, harmonizer stuff. But um, especially, you know, he does the octave up thing or you can do the octave down thing. But I, I mean, I've kind of experimented with all of it. I I still do want to figure out how to get it more into like a, my acoustic, quote unquote, acoustic jazz music or whatever, whatever it is. And but I don't know. I've been trying to think maybe of going to uh, switch, switch the pedal board. I mean, I've had the same one for so long. They got to be way better now. I know Zoom is making one now that has um, that's supposed to be for instruments, too. Uh, but there was always like so many things to deal with in terms of like having an outboard, like transportable preamp that I used to carry around with me to gigs is the preamp and the clip on mic that would have to go into the pedal board and then out back to the preamp so I had a two channel preamp go back to the back out to it and then send it out to the house and then the, the people never wanted to plug it right in so then you got to have a direct a direct box then it's got to have you know all this stuff so I got sick of carrying all that stuff around and when I moved to New York I stopped carrying it around altogether because it was way too much gear but I don't know Yes, so I've done it for a, I've done it a bunch. All right, so here's a question from J Coop sixteen. Hi, Mr. Finzer. My name is Jeremiah. How does someone go about learning scales? Well, this is going to sound stupid, but one at a time. Uh, honestly, um, I have a major two major scale workouts on um, YouTube. You can check those out. Um, you just have to play them so much that you can't play them wrong, right? And a lot of times what people do is they memorize slide positions, especially at the beginning. This is a very, uh, it seems like a shortcut, but it's actually way making it a longer cut. Uh, no, that's not a shortcut. It makes everything harder. So don't learn slide positions, learn the notes. And then any scale, like any parent scale, major, melodic minor, harmonic minor, harmonic major, is going to have one of each note, meaning A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Uh, it's but it's going to start in a different place. So it's always B C D E F G A B or C D E F G A B C, but just different flats and sharps. It's always the same. They always go in order. So um, you say I'm going to play from C to C in this key signature. I'm gonna, or I'm going to play A to A in this key signature, and that's going to give you the answer. So whether it's major, minor, melodic minor, harmonic minor, harmonic major, and uh, that's how I learn scales. So play them so much that they are inside of you. You know, that's why I have those major scale workouts because I find that people practice the scale, but they don't practice the sound and they don't have the sound like 
instilled in them. They don't know how Dorian feels different than Major. They just say, oh, it's, you know, it's minor with a raised natural six and a flat seven. Like all those things are true, but there's like a sound to each mode and a sound to the scale in general and a sound to the triads. And we deal with all of that. So I highly recommend go check out the Major Scale Workout 1.0 and 2.0. Because I just posted last month a, a, an update, a 2.0 to that. So go check that out, Jeremiah. One scale at a time, master it, move to the next one. And uh, the sooner you learn all your, all your major scales, the sooner you're going to be really you know, flexible on the instrument. That's for sure. Who are some bass trombone players you recommend checking out? Uh, there's lots of great bass trombone players I recommend checking out. In terms of improvising, there might be slightly less, but there's a great freelancer in New York named Max Seigel, S-E-I-G-E-L, Max Seigel. He's a fantastic bass trombone player, also improvises really great. Jeff Nelson is another one great player in New York. Doug Proviance, he is in the Village Vanguard Orchestra. And he uh, is really, really great bass trombonist. Uh, Reggie Chapman, if you don't know Reggie, Reggie is uh, also in New York. He plays tuba and bass trombone. He plays with Lucky Chops. He plays uh, with a lot of his own projects. And he's got, uh, he's a great improviser. And he's a master of like all the different horns, like multiple different horns with the triggers. I mean, that's why I'm doing this weird motion with my left hand. Um, so he's he's really great. And um Chris Glassman is another one. He won the UNT uh, Jazz Trombone Competition last year. And Gina, Gina Benalcazar is a great, a great one. Jennifer Wharton, if you know Jennifer, she is uh, in Darcy James Argue's band. She's played, I mean, she's played with everybody uh, in New York. She's a great freelancer. She also plays tuba. And yeah, there's, there's a lot of really great bass trombonists. I hope that gets you started uh, with bass trombonists. So yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I'm leaving people out, I'm sure. But I mean, obviously, Dave Taylor is an amazing bass trombonist. And then there's all of the classical people. And I, so I'm sorry for um, leaving you out. So that's the problem when people ask for recommendations. Ken, can you talk about your experience at Juilliard? Sure, I can talk about my experience at Juilliard. That's, where, that's how I met Will Hawley, uh, who was on here earlier. Um, so Juilliard was... I mean, it's totally different now. Just, you know, put that out there to start because it was almost, the faculty was almost completely different than what it is right now. And I think the vibe and everything was different. And, but my experience was, overall, I wouldn't trade it. I wouldn't go back uh, and not do it. I would say that it was more of an experience and a gauntlet than it was like, a very clear curriculum based educational experience and by that i'm not necessarily disparaging the school i'm just saying that it was very much based on doing stuff and very much based on like experiences and learning through experiences more than more than like taking classes that's all i mean by that and um so there's a lot of positive things that happened. You know, I really enjoyed my time working with Steve Teray. He was my teacher then. You know, there's been some things that have come out that he may have, that he did, you know, later that, you know, he's not there anymore. But, um, you know, I had good experience with him. I know a lot of people have had negative experiences with him. Um, I had some negative experiences in some classes, but... Overall, like I said, I wouldn't trade the camaraderie. I wouldn't trade the the um, the people that I know from it. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't trade the experience. You know, it was always a huge goal of mine to go there, and I wanted to go for undergrad, and I didn't get in, which was a blessing in disguise, I think, in the long run, because I wasn't ready for New York when I was seventeen, because uh, I started college when I was seventeen, and um, yeah, I wasn't ready, and it just wasn't going to be the right thing you know for me so it was good that I waited to go and then I went once I was 21 or whatever um, so yeah I mean I think it's totally different Taylor now and I think it's a, a lot um, I don't actually know somebody else could tell you but I think that th the problems that I encountered I think have changed since so I know Dr. Aaron Flagg is putting a lot of work into into um, keeping everything uh, rolling along smoothly and uh, I don't know. I mean, I haven't talked to you more about it, but overall, it was great. I loved um, a lot of it. You know, we got to do a lot of cool things and met people I wouldn't trade for the world. Uh, and 
But like I said, like was it as organized educationally as Eastman was? No. But I did I need that at that moment? No. I always like to say that it's like Juilliard was way more artist development and Eastman was way more craftsperson development. You know, if you've heard me talk before, I talk about the balance between art artistry, uh, artistry and um craftsmanship in terms of uh, developing both at the same time. So making sure that you're great at your instrument, being able to play as a freelancer, do anything that somebody asks you to do, but also uh, being a, an artist and developing as an artist. So I, I weigh those two. And for me, it was a good balance going to Eastman for one and going to Juilliard for the other. So that in that way, um, that, you know, that was very, very proactive, uh, appropriate, appropriate for the order. It's how important is the education in music. Uh, do you? I don't know if you mean like getting a degree. I don't know how important it is to get a degree in music necessarily. I think that the process of going to music school and developing those social social networks are extremely important. Getting in a circle with a lot of other people that are interested in what you're doing, it's a great way to move to a new city and meet people that are in the scene. Your teachers, your colleagues at the school, all of those things together make it a great way to kind of break into a new scene. Um, do I think, do you 100% need to go to school in music to be successful in music? Absolutely not. Uh, you do not need to get a degree in jazz or classical or whatever to be successful. You just have to practice and get with the right teachers. Um, but there's a lot of things about school, like I was saying, that are experiential that you won't get if you don't go to music school. Um, which could be a good thing, could be a bad thing. Um, but I think it's important to go and be around like-minded people. And I say this a lot. And I say this about some students that I interact with, not necessarily my students at UNT, but just all over the country, is that like, you know, some people are really, really talented. And I don't really like that word, but they're really, really naturally gifted in being able to play their instrument, but they don't have that obsession. You have to, I believe, at some point be obsessed with what we're doing. You have to be obsessed with getting better. You have to be obsessed with um, that thing. If it's jazz, if it's trombone, if it's trumpet, if it's saxophone, you have to be obsessed with it for a while. Like you have to focus on that one thing. And often it's just kind of like a byproduct of they, sometimes they were good at something, but they weren't necessarily like obsessed with it and an, an obsession, like in a good way, like it gets you excited. It makes you fill up inside. Like you feel good when you're spending time on it, you know, being obsessed, going deep, you know, you can't, you probably won't, I'll just say, get that far in this industry because there's going to be somebody else that you are competing against, quote unquote, for the same gigs that is obsessed and did spend that time in the practice room and did let that fill them up. And so I just I think you, at some point, not forever, you and I'm not saying that you should be in the practice room 10 or 12 hours a day every single day or something crazy like that. I'm just saying that like you got to go deep into something. And if it's if it's a certain era of jazz trombone, so you can be a specialist in one kind of area and also great at the rest, but you're kind of like your thing, you know, you got to go deep, you got to go hard. And so that's what I think. Anyway, so the question was really about should you go to music school? And I kind of went deep like that. But uh, I don't know that you should or should not. I do know it was important in my development, and I know plenty of musicians that didn't go to music school that are doing just fine. But most people tend to now, whether that's a good thing or not, is yet to be seen, I think, because uh, we've kind of swung all the way. Kind of the pendulum has swung all the way to one side, and it probably needs to meet back somewhere in the middle because there's a certain amount of experiential learning that you need. Uh, it's way different than the school learning. And the school learning can also be really important because you do need to know how to like spell uh, F7 sharp nine. That's also true. So uh, I don't think it's one or the other. I think it's, I think it's both, you know. What skills are you looking for in an audition for grad school? All right, I'll get to that in a second. And just so I don't lose it, Ellie Reza says, what do you think about Berkeley? Um, I don't know a lot about Berkeley other than uh, the trombone teacher they used to have, which was Marshall Jilks, who was amazing. Um, a really good friend of mine, musician Cheryl Bailey, she's working there in the guitar department. They have so many great teachers there um, and so many great musicians have come out of there. Um, I think it's great. I don't know. I don't really know anything about it. So I don't feel super compelled to offer an opinion on something I don't really know that much about. I'm just going to so sorry, I don't really have a great opinion. I know 
Uh, somebody that plays in my band, Alex Wince. Go hit him up here. Alex Wince, you can find Wincegram. He went to Berkeley. He played, and then we went to school together at Juilliard. He could give you the comparing and contrasting of uh, Juilliard and Berkeley. So Roberto, what skills are you looking for in an audition for grad school? So that's a good question. And so if you're trying to come to UNT in particular for grad school and study with me, you know, our TA, or right now we have a new one that just started. His name is Jack Courtright, if you want to look him up. He uh, just came to us from Eastman, and he, he plays really well. Uh, he writes music, arrange, writes and arranges music, and is also has some experience teaching. So those are like the three components that we're looking for. Uh, what I'm looking for is somebody that has that obsession. I'm looking for somebody that I can tell has dove really deep. I'm looking for someone who, in the case of UNT, you know, the program is pretty intense, so you got to be somebody that can handle that. And him coming from Eastman, I knew he could do that. And then also somebody that I know wants to do work and put time in uh, to shed and to practice and maybe to uncover some new ground. Um, they have to have that curiosity and that obsession. You know, they have to want to be in school. Um, you know, oftentimes. You know, Dallas is not New York. You know, Denton is not New York. So when you go there, especially right now during all of this craziness, like there's not that much work to be had. And so if you got to be somebody that wants to get in the shed and practice, you know, if you don't want to do that, you're trying to get somewhere and just play gigs. Maybe it's not the best choice, you know. So um, it's a combination of a lot of things. But basically, it's like I want you to be interested in what I have to share. Like, can I actually teach you something from my experience, you know, like I'm an improviser and I focus on improvisation and that's what we talk about in lessons on all different styles, all different eras. But if you don't care about improvisation, you probably don't want to study with me because I, you know, I, I don't, I'm not going to change what's important about my musical ideas. Um, so I want to find somebody that's on the same page. So that can be a big part of it. You know, we, we do a lot of playing in the audition, but there's also a lot of talking and getting to know one another and making sure that it's going to be a good fit. You know, that's really important to do if you're, you're looking at schools to make sure you have a good fit with the teacher. Um, it goes both it goes both ways, because if you don't like my teaching style or my communication style, you're not going to learn very well from me and you're not going to enjoy the experience. Um, but it's somebody that really wants to be an improviser. Uh, it's somebody that has put in some time uh, all across genres, all across um, all across the history. You know, trying to trying to get better. And it has to be somebody that I can tell like wants to get better. That's basically it. Those things. The passion has put some time in, and uh, I think that we can do some good work together. Those are what I'm looking for. Uh, for potential grad students and uh, and also some experience with teaching because at UNT uh, RTFs do teach uh, they run uh, our jazz trombone ensemble we co co run that and also teach secondary lessons and some other things if you're more if you're interested in UNT stuff uh, all the information is on if you go to jazz trombone so jazz tromb dot o n e uh, you can find all that information and there's a new video coming next week with all the audition requirements, the updates for 2020. So if you are interested in that, that's coming on Wednesday. Do you recommend to take online course instead of face to face classes? If you can't get to where the classes are, take them online. But like I said before, the, the experience of going to music school is just as much about the experience as it is uh, about the, the actual knowledge. You can get the knowledge from anywhere. You can find everything that I know is available on the internet. You don't need to come to me to find it, but I'm going to kind of parse it through my lens to try to help you to understand it and kind of customize it to what you need and what you're trying to achieve. So um, that's the benefit of being in person as opposed to being online and learning just from YouTube or something like that. But I think there's a great model of being able to do both. You know, I've been teaching online since 2016. I've been posting, I've run a virtual studio where I post lessons every week. We do master classes every month. And I think it's very, very effective. Is it the same as in person? No. Um, so I think, I think uh, you got to do both. And right now we can't do everything because of the world. But, you know, you need to do what you need to do. So, um, Ali Reza, I hope that that helps you. Uh, if you can't get to where the classes are, you know, now is the best time ever in the history to try to pin down uh, a jazz musician to take a lesson. That's for sure. Sight reading is a huge component. What are some materials you give your students to boost their reading? I don't give anybody any sight reading materials. 
other than go read every single thing that you possibly can get your hands on, which is anything, everything. Um, play along with big band records. There are various things online that you can find if you put your mind to it uh, about uh, the different big band charts and stuff like that. Uh, just read anything, read everything. I think that you should be able to cite read notes like you cite, like you read your native language. So if it's English or it's another language, like you read it and you understand it, that's what reading music should be like. So until you can get there, you got work to do. You know, for me, it's like if I make a mistake, I'm very upset at myself for sight reading because I, I want it to be so natural. That's my level. That's where I hold myself to. If it's not perfect, then I still got work to do. And I, uh, so read everything, read anything, read etude books, read transcription books, read everything. So I don't have a specific resource. It's literally pull anything off the shelf and, uh, and read it. All right, Wiley asks, how do you approach your writing process, especially for cast of characters? Well, uh, it's in the other room, but my general thing that I do is I just start writing. That's my writing process. And that's like, okay, I'm going to write something every day. I'm just going to write. It doesn't matter if it's good. It doesn't matter if it's bad. It doesn't matter if it ends up being a tune or part of a tune or an orchestration idea. Just start writing, make it a practice, and then um, go from there. So what I mean is like, put 20 minutes in, put two hours in that you're going to spend writing and writing only, you know? Not practicing, but writing. Practice the practice of writing, if that makes sense. So then, you know, I try to come up with some different ideas. I use a lot of ideas that are stolen from people like Bob Brookmeyer and Maria Schneider. Dave Ravello is a composer that helped me kind of get stuff going for myself. Ryan Truesdell is kind of all in the same school of taking ideas from one to kind of taking one idea breaking it out into its component parts and then kind of reinventing so i'm just writing ideas like all right here's a major triad how many different ways can i harmonize it how many different ways can i organize the order of the notes this 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 so just like write ideas write stuff i use a big piece of uh, big band score paper actually and just you know write in different clefs and different things and i circle this and i draw all over it just as sketches so i have sketches all over different chunks of melody i also have a notebook of um like a five by seven notebook full of staff paper and i write things in there so always by hand always on the trombone or at the piano and then from there um, i translate it onto the computer and then it becomes like okay this is, a, this is a good thing. How, what am I going to do with this? And then slowly start to flesh it out into uh, what it might be if it's for my band, my sextet. Like, uh, okay, so what's Lucas going to play? He's going to play tenor. He's going to play bass clarinet. But basically the most important part is just that first part, which is generating ideas, generating ideas that are related to one another or not related to one another and being like, all right, this doesn't fit in this bucket. If I'm trying to write this one piece, this that last record, cast of characters, all came from one opening idea. And I've said this before, it's the opening idea you hear on the first track. So that first track is um, the sorcerer. So you hear the piano, he plays this descending two triads, D major and D flat major. And they're stacked on top of each other, which I stole from Chick Corea. I was just, that's that's what it is. I heard Chick do that. And I was like, oh, that's killing. And then I said, oh, how, what can I do with this? And so the whole album came from, it's not exactly that, but the whole album came from this giant sheet of brainstorm paper that I used um, generating ideas from that one idea, that those two triads on top of each other. Because the triads can be melodies, the triads can be key centers, the triads can be uh, pitch collections, the triads can be um, just portions like you can take some out take two notes out and you got four notes a four note grouping or a two note grouping you know there's so many possibilities so when i'm in that brainstorming it's just all the possible ideas not judging whether it's good or bad but just all of the ideas idea 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 just keep going and going and going until i run up and so it might take an hour each day for like a week or two weeks i'll probably start putting some things into the computer soon um but I don't write in the computer because I it doesn't feel natural when it comes out the other end, usually for me. Uh, that doesn't mean other people can't because they can and it's great. But for me, when I put it into the computer, it becomes so literal and it kind of shuts off my imagination. You know, when I write it and it's in pencil, I can imagine all these different possibilities and all these colors. And so after I have that, then I start to think about the vibe of what an idea has. 
So what do I mean? That's probably a little abstract, but what is the vibe of the idea? So is it happy? Is it sad? Can it be manipulated? Can it represent a character in this case for cast characters? Um, is it, is it, does this sound like fast or slow or swing or straight eighth notes or whatever? And I start to group things together and be like, oh, these two ideas could be related. Like this could be the A section or B section. This could be an interlude. And you kind of kind of slowly piece them all together. And so then I get tunes and I kind of get the outline of tunes, like with the melody at least. And then depending on how, depending on this, the setting, like meaning like what, how it's going to be performed is like how I determine how deep I'm going to go with the composition part. Meaning like, is this a tune? Does it need to be just a simple melody and then chord changes and then we can kind of just play it? That's one great way, you know, I like doing that. But then sometimes you need something more orchestrated, something more with more notes. So for example, this last record, cast of characters, if you listen to it as compared to the one before, No Arrival, No Arrival is a lot less orchestrated. It's more tunes and we're just playing and improvising. Whereas on cast of characters, it's like there's a lot of notes that were written out. There's kind of free sections that transition into time. There's a lot of instructions on the music. It's very much more constructed in like the sense of like a, a, a big band chart or something. Not, not a, you know, I don't know, something more written out stuff, for lack of a better way to put it. Um, so that's the, that's kind of my process. Um, and so then all the orchestration choices and everything like that, that all comes after. That all comes after I've kind of got the tune together. Because if you don't have a strong melody, in my opinion, if you don't have a strong melody, it's going to be hard to create an interesting piece of music um, without something to the, for the ear to latch onto. Because I've written the other way where I've written vamps first and I've written bass lines first. And sometimes they turn out great. But for me, sometimes they turn out really bad. And I'm like, oh, man, this is nothing. This sounds like... As, uh, as Steve Trey doesn't say, used to say to me, it's like, it's all this and none of this. Meaning it doesn't have a lot of emotion or a lot of heart to it. So um, that's, how, that's sometimes what I think about when I'm listening to my music back. I'm like, does it have this? Does it hit you there? Sometimes the pieces do, sometimes they don't. Different people will react in different ways. But just for me, you know, if it gives me, when I'm imagining of it, imagining it if it gives me like chills or i'm like just playing on the piano i'm like all right this is going to be a moment that i'm gonna that i'm gonna uh, remember all right so taylor hatch he asks what is your teaching philosophy okay so for a long time i thought i didn't have one really but the older i get the more i realize that i actually am quite opinionated about things uh, in good ways and bad ways. So I try to be self as self-aware as possible. I have my blind spots just like everyone, but I try to be self-aware of my biases and I try not to put them onto my students. I think it's a little bit uh, impossible to not. Uh, they're going to get some of that no matter what. But my overall philosophy is that every student needs to be treated as an individual student based on where they've come from, what their goals are, and where they want to go, and what they're obsessed with. So the most difficult situation is when you get into lessons with a student and you can tell that they're not interested or obsessed with this thing and they're just, just going through the motions, right? So that's what I mean when I say about we have to be compatible because I'm like intense. I'm like, let's go. Let's dig in. Let's get to work. Let's really uncover something about this music while we're working together. Um, so my philosophy generally is that we need to, in terms of jazz trombone, first of all, you got to play the trombone first or you cannot be an improviser. You have to have control over your tool. So if you don't know how to articulate, if you don't have a good sound, if you're not flexible, if you don't have clarity in your articulation, those are the four areas we need to attack first. Because you can't play like JJ, you can't play like Elliot Mason, you can't play like Marshall Jilks if you don't have those things together. So we focus a lot on basics, those trombone basics first, and if you don't have those together, we can't get to the improvisation stuff. So get we work on that. And then I, my philosophy with just approaching, I mean, there's so much jazz stuff out there, and especially with trombone uh, in particular, there's so many different styles, and like there's kind of like a West Coast style, and like, like an East Coast style, or maybe it's like East Coast plus like Detroit style, because I, uh, I feel like it's kind of all unified a little bit, but... Um, 
there's these two different kind of disparate kind of streams of jazz trombone. And then um, I go to the middle and work outwards. That's my philosophy in, in uh, terms of jazz trombone history is we, I go to JJ Slide Curtis right in the middle, dealing with bebop, dealing with harmony that's very specific and particular, meaning um, bebop has such particular way that the chords move, the voicings move, the voice leading moves, that I go to that stuff first. So American songbook tunes, jazz tunes, bebop tunes, we have to master those basics first, and then we go out from the middle. So when you go forward, you end up doing getting into tunes that are more uh, modal with like Wayne Shorter type stuff or like more free from there and into like modern stuff that incorporates um, a lot of different sounds than like even Wayne Shorter was using, even though they're probably still related because they are related. And also we go backwards. So you go backwards and you talk about what got JJ to JJ. You know, there's Benny Green and there's Jimmy Cleveland and there's um, these other people that are transitional. Uh, JJ likes to talk about Frank Rehack as being one of his big influences. And so we go backwards then, and we, we talk about the Swing Era Cats and the Ellington Band Cats, like Lawrence Brown, and we talk about uh, Tricky Sam and all these people, and then you go back all the way to Jack Teagarden, back further, get some Kid Ori. So that's, what, that's my overall philosophy is kind of go to the middle and go both ways. So if Taylor, if you're still on, feel free to follow up on your question. Ali Reza, what do you do to motivate to get better every single day? Um, by showing up, by doing work every day. Um, by finding the joy in the process of doing it, you know. You gotta pay, I used to just, I would be anxious in college if I didn't put in the time on the horn. Um, I, that's just the truth. Like I would get super anxious and I couldn't function in um, a social situation unless I had put in the time on my horn. So I just make it a non-negotiable. That's how you do it. You make it non-negotiable. Just like things like brushing your teeth or going to the bathroom or whatever. Eating. Practicing is part of my routine. It's not even part of my routine. It's a non-negotiable. That You know what I'm saying? Like there's certain things that you decide about in your life that are not negotiable. Like drinking water, breathing air, and for me, playing the trombone, practicing music, it's doing something related to that thing that I'm obsessed with. Um, I Maybe that's an overly simplistic view, but I find that that's how you are motivated. I don't have to motivate myself because I'm going to do it. Anyway, um, we were just talking about motivation. And uh, so you got to be highly motivated. You got to be, um, you got to just make it part of your non negotiable daily routine. That's what it has to be. Make it non negotiable. It's part of your daily routine, it's part of what you do, like eating or drinking water. Or whatever so that's how i stay motivated and because for me i have such big picture goals of what i want to do with myself and my music um i there's nothing there's nothing that's going to stop me from keeping on going so that's how i feel about that but thanks for being here i really appreciate you all and as usual um hope you have a fantastic weekend and uh we'll see you next time